and you're a fucking excellent high fiver. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. Miss Gina. And this is the Concept Crucible podcast. How's it going? It, it's going pretty well. It's Thanks, going. Ryan. Yeah, not bad. I see that you uh, have a, a notification on your calendar. Shut up. <laughs> Listen, I have an important appointment at 1130 tonight for a work thing. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I guess we better get the show under underway. Yes, indeed. So, Jada, you are our guest, and we neglected to introduce you because we're awful human <laughs> beings. I got distracted. I saw something flash. Say shut up. <laughs> <laughs> this is Gina, and you are joining us because you are our expert on today's topic, which is head cannon. I, I don't know if that's a compliment. You are <laughs> certainly the. Actually, no, you're not. You're you're probably not the leading person in my life because I know a bunch of doctoral students that study it. But <laughs> yes, you were the one who intru- who who. who Created my my largest and and sort of widest head cannon. So uh, that you're blaming me? No, I'm crediting you. Oh, crediting good, you. Good. I, I enjoy it. <laughs> um, so, Icebreaker, what is your biggest, weirdest, like widest head cannon where you're most deeply invested? Well, do you think maybe we should hold and and explain what head cannon is? First? Icebreaker goes first. Ryan, fine. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm just saying maybe for the <laughs> folks at home who are a little unsure of what head, maybe we can give a like, Cole's notes. Definition or a Cliff's Notes in America or a Cliff's Notes. Uh, Head canon is stories you tell about characters. So, as opposed to role playing, which are stories you tell about your character, these are other characters. So, in Mass Effect, for example, you might tell stories about your crewmates. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and their rendezvous. <laughs> or you know, so video games. Um, TV shows, it's, movies. It's picking up, it's either picking up where a story, any story, any media story, uh, either ends or there's blackout spots. So uh, if there's a time gap or you continue the story in your head after a movie has ended, uh, or create origin stories for certain characters, uh, it usually starts, or sort of the spark for a lot of people with headcanons is a romance side thing, where you take two characters and you like to put them together, and in your head, you you think that they're dating, or in your in your head, they have this relationship going on behind the scenes, and hence headcanon. Mm-hmm. So it's not canon in the story, but it is arc. But it's canon it, in my it, heart. It is canon in my heart and canon in my head. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> But and we we have deeply invested elaborate headcanon <laughs> in lots of things. Um, but the 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 question for the icebreaker is the the place where you have invested deepest. Deepest. Okay. Uh, I will go first, um, even though usually we make the guest go first <laughs> uh, because I'm sitting in the middle in the guest spot. If you are listening, I'm sitting in the middle. That's why I'm so effing loud. <laughs> but. Mine is definitely Skyrim. Like, I have a lot of video game headcanon and movie headcanon, but Skyrim, like, nonstop. I've got 900 hours in that game. I have, like, enemies and allies and, like, deeply invested notions in all of these characters in the world. You know, like, I, I will never, ever give Sven the time of day because the first thing Sven ever asked me to do was take a letter to the girl he liked lying about uh, her other paramour like the her other suitor rather and and I'm like dude that's really not cool and I told him that and he's like just take the letter take the quest and so I got up to her and I had the option to be like hey Sven told me to give you this letter to, and to tell you it was from your other suitor here you go figure it out she's like good not talking to Sven anymore see ya Ironically, once you finish her quest, you can, you can marry her instead of her other suitor. <laughs> but, yeah, like I have all these relationships with characters in there, and, you know, I've devoted an unreasonable amount of time uh, giving, not just imagining what they do in their off time, but in the game, giving them things to do in their off time. You know, like, here's your house. This is where you live. Stay here. Hmm. <laughs> Gina um, so anybody that 
knows me is going to assume that the first thing that I would say is Mass Effect. Uh, and that is probably where I recognized I started building head cannons and fan fictions and, and things like that in my head. Mm-hmm. And it's probably the, the most elaborate one that I have. But if you're asking for deepest investment... Um, it is certainly my uh, playable character of Hawk mm. in Dragon Age 2. Oh, man. And that is that is one where I have... The, my, the, the headcanon in that is so strong, um, and it mirrors the storyline. It's just those additions. It's there... If you haven't played uh, Dragon Age 2, the story takes place in sort of chapter-esque type sections and there's even a one to two year three year gap uh, sometimes in between each of those sections so the head canon comes in sometimes you know in between what happened in the between time what happened um, you know the night after your lover ran away uh, and things like that so I, I've been so invested in that one that I have actually stopped the game because something in the game wrecked my head cannon to the point where I had to rewind and start over um, and go forward to the point where, um, and this was my deepest, darkest secret for, for many years, is that I never finished playing Dragon Age 2 because I knew uh, a key ending piece that involved another character and, uh, spoiler the death of another character that I couldn't face. I my head cannon was was so invested that I could not face in game carrying out this cutscene. So I I left it and sat it on the shelf for years. And it was actually I finally got the the the, the guts up to go back and finish it this year. And I turn on my Xbox 360, which has been moved two times since then, and it red ringed, and my game is just lost. Now you'll never <laughs> this, know. I will. I will. I will never know, except for thankfully the power of YouTube yeah. and that that I. <laughs> Double spoilers <laughs> um, for a game that came out literally years ago. Uh, Anders deserved to die. He's a monster. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I'm sorry. I did it with a smile on my face and a song in my heart. No. <laughs> You monster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ryan? Um, I suppose to some who are listening to the podcast or watching us, it's probably no surprise that I um, really like Power Rangers. Maybe not Linkara like Power Rangers, but I do very much like Power Rangers. Link to Linkara's history of the Power Rangers in the show notes. Yeah, I, I'm. it's strange how he caught up with what's currently broadcasting. It's, it's, there's no new episodes anywhere. I'm a little heartbroken. Um, but I liked Power Rangers, and sometime, I think I was still in high school, but I remember it was, it was a little while back, um, I ran into <clears throat> somebody else's fan fiction of, uh, a Power Rangers team, and this was pre-Dino Thunder, so it would have been, uh, high school, and, uh, so I liked, I liked reading that person's fan fiction, uh, but I, I wanted to do my own, and I, but I wanted to integrate it more with the story. And I always liked Adam, the um, the second Black Ranger, then became Green Zeo Ranger, then Green mm-hmm. Turbo Ranger. I always liked him of uh, as a character, so I thought, would it be cool if he mentored a new team? Uh, which and then conveniently, when Dino Thunder came out, they did that exact idea with Tommy Oliver, you know, uh, mm-hmm. mentoring the new team. And so and it was one of those things of like, okay, well, how do I how do I create a new system of Power Rangers and still tap into the morphing grid? And I'm like, well, wouldn't it be cool if you take like the light speed rescue idea of a civilian outfit? But how do you get a civilian outfit to tap into it without like being super genius and just making stuff up as you go? And I'm like, well, like how do I get them into it? And I'm like, okay, well, there's always the Zeo Zords; they weren't destroyed. But that seems like too much of a cop What if, like, this guy was, like, a scientist and he and he wanted to, like... His wife had died in, in one of the monster attacks and he wanted, to, he wanted to make Power Rangers and make it his own and stuff. And, like, wait a second. I was... Thank God Wikipedia was around. Like, the Dragon Zord had never been destroyed. It was still sitting in Angel Grow Bay. What if he, like, was diving and he found it and he got into the cockpit and he was able to reverse engineer it and like tap into the power grid that way and like he started and then he and Adam were and I just went from there 
So, so I would like to point out that first off, I like how you say pre Dino Thunder, like that's a, a period in time that all of us will immediately recognize. Um Power Rangers timeline in the show notes if I can find one. Um but also like I would like to point out that you told that story in the pre show and I am no less like happy and joyous at your second telling of it <laughs> because it is incredible. <laughs> and I think that's like that kind of illustrates what kind of headcanon can do. So I'm sitting here and I watched Power Rangers in that I know enough, but I, you know, that was techno babble to me, <laughs> like, like 90% or more. But at the same you can time. You told Zord from a Z, though. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um,. I'm sitting here listening to it, but you that's the thing. You get invested with it. The stories, they're percolating in your head. Years later, you still remember going through this. And that's that's what headcanon kind of does, is, mm-hmm. is you're, you're making and creating these stories in your head and going forward with what was behind the scenes, what was, you know, afterwards, what, what, what came next or what came before, mm-hmm. what came during uh, for it. Yeah, so I, like, I have a lot of elaborate headcanons. I get a lot of them when I'm sick. When I'm sick, I watch, like, just trash action movies. And I try and listen for what's coded in them. Hmm. So I remember, I think it was when I had the flu like a year ago, I watched all the Expendables movies. Which, don't do that. Just (laughs) pro tip, don't. Um, You have to be very ill already (laughs) to not become ill. But I watched all of them and I realized that they make a lot more sense if you imagine that Sylvester Stallone's character, Barney, is just like this old army queen who loves hanging out with big, muscly dudes. And you're, you're just like, oh, oh, that's not banter. They're flirting. <laughs> like, they're obvious. Most of them are like obviously straight or at the very least, you know, straight presenting. Um, but it's like, like they seem to entertain Barney's like harmless flirting the whole time is, you know, they're, they're mentor and employer and benefactor in some cases, because these are mostly like guys and it is pretty much all guys who all they know how to do in life is break stuff. (laughs) Now, so there, there is nothing more satisfying, like, if you're doing headcanon in the middle of a show or middle of a series or something, and then that headcanon comes true. Corey-sama? Right? And yeah, Corey, yes. Oh. But, I mean, I'm just picture. I'm just imagining the scenario you just gave, and if that's the next movie, then Where, it would just be... Are you kidding? <laughs> I thought for sure that when, in, in Expendables 2, when Stallone throws down with Jean-Claude Van Damme, like... Watch that scene. I'll dig it up on YouTube if I can find it. And there's a lot of double entendres in that where you're like, are they just going to make out? Like, for serious, are they just going to make out right now? I like, uh, this might this might deviate a little bit from headcanon, but I like uh, like trailer recuts and stuff. And they had the one where it was uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin mm. fighting, but they threw Whitney Houston behind it. And everything just seems so much more passionate. <laughs> Oh man, I get for mine. Most of mine is games, though. Um, like when I was playing XCOM, I'll come up with a little like you. You develop stories for all of your soldiers and and who they are and like what they're gonna get back. At, like, like I will definitely, I definitely had that rookie where I was like, "Listen, rookie, I need you to become a medic. I only have one medic, and it's Hans, and he's wounded. I need more medics." You can't become a heavy or a sniper. I have too many of those. You need to be a medic. I swear to God, if you are not a medic, I'm going to take you back to the base, cut your arms and legs off, and turn you into a robot person, which is a thing you can do in XCOM. Um, and so when they turned into a heavy, they became one of my mech troopers. They rocked face. <laughs> I was like, I do not regret cutting off your arms and legs, sir. <laughs> As I promote you to colonel. I think a games, uh, especially a role playing game, really lends itself to it because you're you're adding, and and there's a fine line between. I think we were we were talking about um, before the show about role playing versus head mm-hmm. Um And I, 
the definition that, that came up with is that headcanon, or sorry, role playing is where you're making up a story for yourself. And then um, headcanon is where you're making up a story for your companions or the NPCs or the characters, maybe even somebody else is playing. Um, I play an online game uh, with my partner and we have two characters and I have a whole ke- headcanon about how we met and how we, we've we dated and, and stuff like that. And and he's sitting there playing going, sounds good, I like that. But <laughs> it's just, it's it's all in my head and it's extenuating that. Or finding an object in... Um, in a video game, in a fantasy setting, if there's a, a weapons drop or it's a special rare item, instead of just, ooh, I found a rare item, making a story of how you actually came to have that object so, uh, with it. Go ahead, Ryan. I was just going to say, like, the, I, I don't... So for me, when we were talking about headcanon before, um, I, I seem to be the one that did it the least out of out of the group of us. I tend to allow the, the imposed narrative to, to be the one. But I just, as you were saying that, I do remember in, like, Diablo, because all of the items were all set items with history, but I didn't know mm-hmm. the history. So I'd sometimes try to work out in my head, you know, based on the name or the description, you know, like that kind of thing. So uh, it's, it's I forgot about that entirely. So, yeah, it's it's when you when you fill in all those details. Thinking about items, um, the, the afternoon that Gina introduced me to the notion of headcanon, forget where we were going and what we were doing but i remember you stopped dead in your tracks i remember that. Well, no no the thing that stopped me dead in, in, in my tracks is uh we were talking about dragon age because as you mentioned you're you're super into dragon age and so am i we did a brief dragon age let's play way back like five years ago that was where we discovered that i had no headcanon because ryan walsh i had a different ryan at that time not this ryan a different one but uh, he, he was like, he, he was deeply immersed in all of the story. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm playing this on Nightmare and I'm whooping ass. Next fight. What's this? Treasure? Yeah. He's like, do you read the codexes? I'm like, totally. They give me XP. Next fight. <laughs> but it was, it was this this uh, necklace that you, that, you, that you get from a character in the game. You like find it and you give it to him and he gives it back to you. And it becomes like a, a, a magical item that he can use. And you, like, swore up and down that he gave it to you. And I'm like, no, you find it in a drawer in this cat. Like, I know I put 200 hours into this game. I played it, like, six times. I know where this drawer is. Because I'm like, that necklace got sweet stats. Of course I'm going to find it. (laughs) Dig it out. Get that scene. Get that necklace. Throw it on. Sweet stats. Done. Next fight. (laughs) And, And you're like, no, token of love. Yes, yes. We're was, super deeply involved. Like, it, like, it was Alistair's token of love. And I had actually, my headcanon was so strong that I had forgotten that, that that's actually what you do. And I had played the game actually a couple times. And each time I ran, got the necklace out of the drawer. You're right. I know exactly where it is too. Right? Because I have to get it to give it to Alistair to give it to me. So that he, I can, my head cannon is complete. That he has given me this token of affection. Next fight. <laughs> it sounds like it's the Mandela effect almost. Like you're remembering an alternate reality. I, do, I am. I am. I'm making. Well, I have that. That's where the head cannon came up as well. The 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 one of the biggest ones that I had was uh, Mass Effect was was one of the first ones that I did. It's the most elaborate mm-hmm. one that I had. And spoiler alert for Mass Effect Three. Uh, at the end, you have to make a decision, and one of the decisions I made was to remove technology from the universe. But one of my companions... Like pants? Mm, pants or technology? Okay, so more electronic. There's like a massive EMP Oh, okay, sort of. so like everything else goes, but pants remain. Or skirts. You sound like you're in the pocket of big pants. It's unless, possible. Unless they're like hologram pants and skirts. Ooh, oh, I would hate just... to be wearing my hologram pants when that <laughs> and happens. And then just poof. Gone. What is it? Okay. Is that draft a hologram? <laughs> I hope it's a holographic draft. <laughs> anyway. Anybody? <laughs> Next fight? So one of the companions in Mass Effect is an AI, and she's, an, she's a robot. And in the, um, the DLC, uh, she comes and gives you uh, a gift, 
And she all all it says in the game is that she was shopping in the market, saw you, and decided to give it to you. But it is the weirdest gift possible because you are the space marine, and she gives you a ring. You have there is no possibility of any romantic interest with this person. There's no ties to, it. and she just saw this shiny ring. And there's not even a jokey thing about oh, it's shiny. I wanted to give it to you. And that it's it's inexplicable why she gives you this ring. So the only explanation has to be that she foresaw this, you know, the the quick destruction of electronic, you know, whatever. And she she uploaded herself into a memory chip that is in that ring. And Shepard will find it years later and able to extract Edie back into the real world. May, then- <laughs> I, may I offer an alternate explanation? Absolutely. The you're, ring called out to him. No, no, I was going to go with um, your AI, Edie, is out in the marketplace shopping on the Citadel, sees you, buys that ring. You're like, why'd you buy me this? She's like, well, I heard it was your favorite store on the Citadel. <laughs> I'm a monster. You are. You really are. But, oh my I mean... Goodness. I did hear that. You said it. You said it was your favorite store. Well, see, now this is this is the thing about headcanon. This is my headcanon. It's in my head. You cannot take it away from me. I don't me. wish to spoil your headcanon. Oh, I, yes, you do. No. <laughs> A little. Well, see, but now, see, see, now I've added that. When when you do ask, that is Edie's explanation. Yeah. But my original plan still holds through. Yeah, see, no, it just, down. I'm it down counts. for that. Yeah. Ha, have you ever, so, I, especially now that you're introducing me to the idea of headcanon... <laughs> Like that's the thing. Once you realize it, you just start <laughs> seeing it. It snowballs. No, 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 but have you ever heard somebody else's head cannon and like and it's now you're primed for it? And then you go to watch something, and that's all you can see. Oh like, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it happens a lot with um, shipping or uh, and shipping where two characters are in a relationship together, or somebody says it, and now that that's all you can see. So a big one is Sherlock, mm-hmm. right? Um, the BBC version. That's out. Everybody loves um, Cumberbatch and Freeman together as a couple, and then you start you start looking at that, and then you can't help it. You're watching that, and even if you don't, if you don't ship them together, it infiltrates your brain, and you start seeing, and you start smiling, and you start, it's sort of it's in your head, and but mm-hmm. it's just sort of at the back point. It, it increases the enjoyment. And in a way, the interaction you have with the characters. I do it because I like ruining things for people and people's experience of them. <laughs> so, I mean, when people like embrace that headcanon... Um, ooh, here's a good one. Um, ooh. There's, so there, there's a Killing Joke animated movie coming out soon. I, I, I apologize for bringing up the F word on, on the podcast, <laughs> but uh, and lots of lots and lots of of uh, people, uh, nerds, fans, have a headcanon that the Killing Joke is where Barbara Gordon, um, who gets shot and becomes paralyzed in the Killing Joke, um, becomes a strong character. That's where she like she like overcomes her her uh, trauma. And grows into to being like one of the central characters in the in the in the DC hero universe, and that's headcanon because it's not true. It doesn't happen in the book at all. What happens is that she gets shot and she's never heard from again in basically the whole book. And instead, it's all about Batman and the Joker and this weird like standoff, and where she actually becomes a cool, like fleshed out, strong, awesome character is in stories like Gotham Knights and later on like full on in, in Gail Simone's run on Birds of Prey which mm-hmm. lasted forever and is awesome um, I picked that up from Gail Simone's Twitter like a week ago and it was a thing I've been mulling over but yeah it is it is the kind of headcanon that sort of actively misinterprets a thing in the way that you want it to be rather than the way that it is it, it can be a coping mechanism yeah Absolutely, can be a coping mechanism. I didn't like how that story ended, so that I'm going awful. to. Ad- <laughs> no, that was more of a general statement, <laughs> but yes, specifically that um, coping, so that you can, you know, I don't like how that ended. I'm going to sort of put this in my own head, and mm-hmm. there there is a difference between going completely off script versus following the narrative, which you said, uh, Ryan, in that. You're following the script along, and you're just you're you're building on it. You're giving it those additions. 
uh, to it. Well, it's one of the things I think that makes headcanon awesome. Is it, is it, it lets you tell your own story, it lets you build on a work that's already there. Um, it makes games more fun. I've gotten to the point now where I can't really play an RPG unless I have like a story to go along with it, which makes it really hard to get into new ones. Like I've been trying to get into Pillars of Eternity for like a year now. And I just haven't been able to... Because I haven't played the game enough to know what it's about. Hmm. To know what my story's about. I'm, I'm actually having that problem with uh, Dragon Age 3. I delayed it for many life reasons. And I've just started playing it. And I'm finding myself that because I was so invested with my headcanon and my role-playing with Hawk in the second game that I, I'm almost resentful of the new character. And I don't know what this character's story is. I don't know anything. And I don't mm-hmm. care. I only want to play this game till I get to the point where I can interact with my hawk again from the from the second game. So it's it's this bizarre thing. I don't have a hook. I can't... And I think mm-hmm. you're right, too. If I find that I can't sort of continue stories or I can't see myself... I don't want to use fantasizing or, or being creative about the story in my head. I kind of lose interest. Yeah, yeah and, well, especially because I can go back to those games or the, that media where I do have that, and it feels good. Like, it feels mm-hmm. like coming home. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I, we have a note here about, about to talk about why Headcanon is awesome, and one of the things that I realized, I don't know, about ten minutes ago, is that one of the other reasons that we, we didn't talk about in the pre-show is that it lets you see things and find things that aren't there that need to be there. Um, and the best example of this is, and it, and it comes up all, like, like as, a, as a gag all the time on the, on the internet, but is, is all of the uh, gay or bi mm. shipping that goes on in movies and video games and in those fandoms. Like it's, it's, it's sort of cool to like make fun of Tumblr or DeviantArt about that, but at the same time, when you don't have those re- relationships represented in your favorite media, you are you are sort of required to invent them. Mm-hmm. And it is and and especially because a lot of media is coded like that, it's pretty easy to. Yeah, I mean, even to the point where it gets um, really into like the supernatural shipping, uh, sort of central thing. I'll try and dig up a link from Elise on that. There's um, a fabulous uh, short run anime that uh, I fell in love with called Tiger and Bunny and it's a superhero anime and there when I, I went into it I saw the first little bit and then I went in and looked at the fandom and of course everybody the popular thing to do is ship the two main male characters together Mm -hmm. and I refused to do it but the longer I watched the show the more interested I actually became in that relationship and wanted there to be something else underneath it but I think what actually drew me to pushing there wanting to be a subtle dynamic between these two characters and a love that was growing is because the unfortunate part of that anime is that there is a tropey flamboyant uh, presumed gay character that is just it's an awful awful stereotype mm-hmm. it's unfortunately typical sort of of, of that genre and that where, where that came from that trope I mean um, so because that was so ugly to me I wanted I think that's what lent me to eventually say actually yeah I, I do put you know Barnaby and Tiger together because I want I want that subtle love and relationship that they grow Mm-hmm. In in the show, yeah, like I always think of Supernatural with Dean and Castiel, or Sam and Dean, which is sort of an impressively interesting fandom. Um, but headcanon allows you to find that and find stories and and solace and satisfaction in that where otherwise none would be offered. Mm. Um, for example, my Terminator headcanon. Uh, which I talked about in uh, my headcanon video from Vita, uh, is in Terminator Genesis, which if you haven't seen it again, don't. I was very sick. Very, very sick. 
I finally watched it like last week. Doing don't laundry. do that. No. <laughs> do you need a hug, buddy? I don't know. Like it wasn't it wasn't as offensive as I thought it was going to be. So my it, my head canon is that um, Kyle Reese travels back in time as he does in Terminator Genesis, right in the beginning of the movie. And he finds himself confronted with a version of Sarah Connor who is already a warrior, which is what happens in the movie. And it's her and him and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and they kill a T-1000 in like the first 20 minutes, and it's awesome. And then they just keep killing Terminators in that time, and then eventually ride off into the sunset and... Are like, hey, we're gonna have a world where John Connor grows up with a father, and he turns out to be an even bigger super badass <laughs> instead of literally everything else that happened in that movie. Literally, hold in. Yes, leave your head cannons in the show notes because we wish to absorb them into our <laughs> own, make them part of us as we have made ours part of you. <laughs> Mmm, <laughs> headcanon's delicious. Um, follow Huck on Instagram or Twitter. Gina, do you have Twitter? No. No, oh, Gina doesn't tweet. <laughs> Shetty don't text, Gina don't tweet. Mm. Do what you do. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. Gina. We're signing off. Stay. Awesome fucking hate you also I'm really super glad you didn't hit me in the face <laughs> cause I felt that and that would've fucking hurt like you would've demolished me yep yep